I'm sorry that I speak almost no Italian, so please allow me to present in English. And I have worked in my national health service in my country uh, for 45 years. The last 35 years, I have worked in community mental health teams. And today, I will say a little bit about what I think I have learned. I also have this dual binocular vision because on one hand, I work as a clinician. I have been working in a first episode psychosis team for 12 years recently, and now I change to a team helping homeless people with severe mental illness in London. On the other side, I am a researcher. As we heard from Antonello, I do research in community services, in stigma, and in global mental health. So I'll give you these two perspectives during this talk. My focus is on adult mental health services because that is my experience. And I will use this simple structure, past, present, and future, for this talk. In my country, we have had the maximum number of psychiatric beds in 1954 and we have fewer and fewer and fewer beds ever since then. To jump to one of my conclusions, we do not, we do not have now, we do not have enough acute psychiatric beds in my country. We have closed too many. We had the largest ever program of public building in my country creating 140 large psychiatric institutions, what you call manicomio. This is one. This had over 1,000 patients in North London and was the site of the biggest study on hospital closure. So we closed so many of these hospitals. We closed almost all of these hospitals. And when they began, this is now 130, 150 years ago, these were a program of enormous promise and optimism. We had what was called the mental hygiene movement. They were on hilltops. They were like sanitaria. They had air and clean freshness. But quickly, within 20 years, they were overcrowded and the quality of care deteriorated and they turned from humane to inhumane institutions places where I would not want to be treated in these large institutions, and I would not want any member of my family treated there. So I work here in South London. At the top, you see the River Thames, and I've worked in different parts of South London in these recent years. This is the catchment area for my health system. It's not just a hospital. And when we began, to develop our community services, we literally do lines on the map. Like you, we created a sector, what the French call psychiatrie de secteur. Usually about 60,000 population with one community mental health team. We had larger populations for the more rich and smaller populations for the more deprived. We know that the annual period prevalence of psychosis is about four times more in poor than in rich areas. Variation from 0.2 to 0.8% of the population. And we developed slowly more and more mental health teams in the community. This first team we called an interim or a temporary team. Why? Because senior colleagues said, Community services will be a terrible mistake. You will see patients neglected. There will be murders by patients. There will be more homeless people. And we said, this is possible, and these are empirical questions. We will test if that is true or not, and that was not true. We then developed more and more and more. Eventually, about 100 of these community mental health sites and centers and teams across South London. I worked in this one myself for a few years. It was a shop, then it became a community center, and now 
It's a shop again. It sells baby clothes. The centres grew bigger and bigger. We included not only health staff, but also social workers, and we needed more space, more rooms, as time went on. And then we went into other parts of London, one was called Lambeth, one called Southwark, one called Croydon, and we spread this model throughout our whole catchment area. What did I learn? That multidisciplinary teams in the community are better, on average, are better than people sitting in hospitals or clinics or having a doctor-only service. Why? Because they can provide continuity of care. And why is that important? Because some patients, especially patients with the most severe conditions and symptoms, cannot or will not come to a clinic or a facility. And without follow-up, they probably will deteriorate again and again and again. And that is poor quality care. It is also inefficient and expensive care. So who is in the mental health team in the community? You know, although it's a little bit different in Italy because I think you have relatively more doctors and relatively fewer nurses than my country. Who is in the team? Whoever, whichever staff are available in that place or in that country. You can see some of the disciplines here. I want you to meet Bella. So she is a new member of an early intervention psychosis team in South London. And why do I mention her? Because the nature of the staff in our community mental health teams has changed over time. And we've added three new types of worker. One are supported employment specialist using the individual placement and support model, the strongest evidence-based approach to helping patients get real open market paid jobs. Secondly, some teams have peer support workers. As we heard from Professor Mai, people whose expertise is their experience, their lived experience of having a mental health condition. And third are people like Bella, a physical health expert, so that people who come, people with psychosis who come to our team, then have an admission physical health assessment, and often we find obesity, diabetes, pre-diabetes, hypertension, smoking, and other problems. So we have these mixed teams of different specialists working in the city. And this approach is in many ways different, indeed the opposite, to the traditional, more parochial or patriarchal system. In the old days, doctors would say, you have to stay in hospital if you have any symptoms, for example, continuing psychotic symptoms. Doctors would feel responsible for all the behavior, all the actions of patients. Now, many, many of the patients I treat have active, sometimes severe psychotic symptoms living at home, living with a family or living alone. They are usually responsible for their actions, although there are clearly sometimes exceptions, and we actively seek to reduce institutionalism by reducing the length of stay. Here are some data from Professor Michaela Tancella and her colleagues here, looking at the change in the service here in Verona. And it's not only an honor for me to speak to you today, it's also a pleasure, because I've worked so closely with Michaela Tancella and his colleagues in the team over many years in Verona. You can see in purple the number of actions or contacts of patients with community services slowly, slowly going up over the years. And in the other colors, the spend and the activity in other components of care gradually going down because, of course, usually the budget is fixed. So this shows the trend, but also how slowly over time these trends took place. So what did I learn from this part of my experience? Sometimes creating stable community services can and should take time. I remember recently 100 long-term patients in 
Johannesburg, I think it was, in South Africa, were suddenly discharged in the community. They were neglected, and many of these people died within months. So this has to be done carefully. It needs to have widespread consultation. I've been involved in six different instances of developing community-based centers. And every time we spent months, sometimes we spent years talking to every possible local group. Use flexibility, but also you will have chances to expand the service when the economy is good, and there will be times when you will have periods of economic contraction when the economy is bad. And you have to expect that and to carry on, to be persistent and to be resilient. Establish very good relationships with your friends and partners in many organizations, including the church, the police, non-governmental organizations, not-for-profit organizations. You need each other. You especially need each other when times are bad. And each time you have a cycle of change, planning what to do next, take very seriously what patients and patients groups and family members groups say about from their experience, from their perspective, what is the most important thing to do next? So I had the chance to lead a national mental health policy for England. You can see here the title. And we proposed first episode psychosis teams across all of England, home treatment teams across all of England, assertive outreach teams, and then general teams seeing everybody else. And within about three years, these teams were established. The implementation was almost complete. In fact, in different areas, there would be extra money if people implemented these teams, and there was less money if they did not. A very behavioral approach. So you can see here these four types of teams that were established. In every area, for example, of 250,000 or 300,000 population, in every part of England, these teams were created. And we started to do some research then about the impact. We found that in areas where home treatment teams were implemented during the daytime, the number of acute psychiatric admissions dropped by about 10%. And we found that in areas where there were 24-hour home treatment teams provided, the number of acute psychiatric admissions dropped by about 20%. If you're interested in the details of this and much more about the evidence for every single component of community care, then a series of chapters are contained in this book called the Oxford Textbook of Community Mental Health, and the second edition will be published within two or three months. So what did I learn from this phase of developing community-based services? Be guided by the evidence if you can, but sometimes there isn't enough evidence to guide you. For example, how do you set up services to support family members? The evidence on family member support is very limited. So sometimes be guided by experience and sometimes be guided by ethics. So evidence and experience and ethics. And be clear which decisions are guided by which and be ready to change as the experience or the ethical position or the evidence changes as well. Do not be rigid. You have to be flexible, including, of course, as you know, during pandemics. If you're interested in how to actually practically implement these principles, then this book also may be helpful, published with experience from many regions around the world. So what about the present? So I've been working recently in this particular early intervention team serving people with psychosis in South London based upon a model developed with Michaela Tansella called the Balanced Care Model. And I'd like to pay a particular tribute to Michaela, who many of you uh, will have known. And he was a, a wonderful colleague of mine, also uh, one of my best friends. This book has been translated into quite a few languages, and the balanced care model has a few basic principles. Most people who have a health problem want to be treated close to home. 
There are exceptions. If you have a rare condition, maybe you'll travel a long way. Most people want treatment specific to their particular individual needs. Most people want to be asked about their condition and treatment and to be involved in deciding the treatment plan. And this, the, the follow through, the consequence, is a mixture of static and mobile services. What do I mean? Static services are provided on a fixed site, for example, a hospital or a clinic. Mobile services can move, perhaps move to the patient's home, perhaps move to a primary care center or to a cafe to meet the patient. And the evidence is not that community services alone and not that hospital services alone can provide a good system of care, but you need both. You need a mix, you need a balance. The balance in particular will change about whether we're talking about a low-income country, for example, Ethiopia, or a middle-income country, for example, Mexico, or a high-income country, for example, Italy or England. And the components uh, you can read, I won't go into details now. But since that time, I've been working on a number of Lancet commissions. One was this Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health. And it helped me to understand that before primary care, before secondary, before specialist care, is a layer that we can call community. This refers to the networks of which we're all a part, which can give us help and strength and resilience and support if we begin to become mentally unwell before we may need to go to a primary care practitioner. You can see here some of the examples, maybe community groups, maybe church or faith groups, maybe sports groups, maybe informal counseling and friends. So what did I learn about some of these developments? Develop services carefully. At each stage of change, going through a new plan or a new policy, Often we need people who do lots with their arms, are charismatic individuals, and who motivate change. But when change in principle accepted, we don't want charismatic leaders, we want, in a sense, boring leaders. People who are careful, people who understand money, people who understand spreadsheets, people who understand how psychiatry does not lose money to the surgeons, People who understand about establishing systems of support and teaching and supervision. People who can grow stable organizations. And again, most of all, find out what patients, what service users say is important. Find out what family members say is important and pay very close attention to what these people say. What about the next stages? You have, at least since 1978 in Basalia, a long and fine tradition of developing community services. We have a strong but slightly later tradition of the same thing. I'd mention a few themes that I think are important in, let's say, the next five to 10 years. First is the comorbidity that so many of the patients we treat, working as psychiatrists, maybe working psychologists and other mental health practitioners, so many of our patients have concurrent physical problems. We know, and the best review is by Walker from uh, the New, uh, New England Journal of Medicine Review, that on average around the world, people with mental health conditions die 10 years younger than everyone else. We know that on average around the world, people with severe mental illnesses die 20 years younger than everyone else for the reasons of which you're aware. So the World Health Organization has produced guidelines about the treatment of chronic and long-term physical conditions among people who have long-term physical conditions with very specific guidelines laid out. Secondly, one of the big forgotten areas is people in the workplace who have mental health problems and people who have mental health problems who cannot get into or stay in the workplace. Again, the World Health Organization has made an important contribution here, launching recently these guidelines about mental health at work with many practical suggestions of what to do, including training senior bosses in organizations and middle managers to identify, to support, to understand, and to link people who have mental health problems to the help they need, both those still in work, called presenteeism, or people off work, called absenteeism. I want to add a word before I finish about stigma. 
About 20 years ago, I had a very general and vague and unpleasant feeling, which I found it hard to identify. After some thinking about this, I identified the problem as stigma, that working in mental health care is in many ways qualitatively different from working in any other domain of health. So I wanted to do something about this. So I wrote a book about it, a book about stigma and discrimination. And then with colleagues, we started a national program in England against stigma and discrimination, a program called Time to Change. It went on for 14 years, one of the longest programs at the national level against stigma. And recently, it was my pleasure to co-lead a Lancet Commission on ending stigma and discrimination in mental health. And I co-led this with Charlene Zunkel, a person who hears voices, who is the founder of the Global Mental Health Peer Network. We wanted to do several things. First is to define stigma. And we came to these four different types of stigma. First, self-stigma, sometimes called internalized. Second, family stigma, sometimes called stigma by association. Third, public stigma. And fourth, structural stigma. Public stigma refers to problems of knowledge and attitudes and behavior. That's misinformation, prejudice, and discrimination. Structural stigma or structural discrimination is least well understood and least well researched. But we know that in every country, miserably small levels of government money and other money are spent on mental health care. Depending on how you measure it, between 24 and 33% of disability in the world is attributable directly to mental health conditions. In many countries, less than 1% of health spending by governments is on mental health. In Ethiopia, for example, it's a half of 1% of the health budget is spent on mental health. And that's just one example of structural stigma. And we know the answer. So from the Lancet Commission work, led by my colleague Eva Heim in Switzerland, we identified systematic reviews about stigma reduction. To my amazement, we found 216 systematic reviews. And then we combined all that information in a method called an umbrella review to try to find the active ingredient to reduce stigma. And the answer is social contact. What does this mean? It means arranging for people who do have or have had experience of mental health problems to have contact with people who do not. This contact can be in person, in a meeting, usually a small meeting, or it can be indirect, digital, or online contact. And in the last few years, there's growing evidence that indirect contact can be as effective for stigma reduction as direct contact. So what have I learned? Stigma and discrimination surround all of us, all of us and all of our patients in the field of mental health. And they attack, enjoying, they attack experiencing so many basic human rights. Family life, work life, social life, life expectancy. They can be reduced using the principle of social contact. And there is now good evidence emerging from at least, I can think of six or eight low and middle income countries around the world. Recent studies in China and in India, for example, in Nepal, that social contact can work in a low income setting, but not exporting a model from a high income country. It's using the principle of social contact, adapting it for context, adapting it for faith and religion, adapting it for culture. So the stigma, I only ask you to remember two words, the words in red, social and contact. Contacto sociale, perhaps. <laughs> so as I finish, uh, a word about why these issues are not, not only of academic interest for me. This is my mother, and she is now 95. Um, 
I find it interesting that her birthday is on Christmas Day. And when I was three, and you can see me here at the age of three, she developed a severe and suicidal episode of depression. She was given different drugs, which didn't help her at all. Uh, interestingly as well, she then had electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, as a day patient. She would go by an ambulance or hospital, not having had breakfast, have ECT and come back. And after about two months, she recovered, and she recovered completely. And her doctor said to her then, um, Rhoda, my dear, um, you will never become depressed again. Now, I would not say to any of my patients who's depressed, you will never become depressed again, because I'm, <laughs> I'm not very good at predicting the future. But the doctor said to her, you'll never be depressed again, and he was right. So far, and she's 95 now, she has not become depressed again. So I have a personal connection to these issues and to the stigma. So to conclude my talk, I want to say something about my experience over these years in developing and then sustaining and then trying to improve community mental health care, some of the barriers and some of the lessons I've learned over this time.